So I'm Devorah Grazer. I am a US patent agent. I'll be talking about patents. Um, we will be sending out the presentation to anyone and everyone who somehow gets your email address to us. So you can sign up there at the email list, but I also encourage you to take either my card or Swathi's card. So that if you do not receive the presentation or an email from us, you can let us know. And the reason is that both Swathi and I are offering a free consultation if you can touch us up by email so we can also then send you the presentation. All right, so my name is Devorah Grazer. I've been doing this for 21 years, which is quite a long time. I'm a programmer, started programming when I was 16. I programmed for the Human Genome Project for four years. Yeah, if you remember that, that was actually a lot of fun. And I'm also a former vice president of intellectual property at a company called Compugen. So I was in-house. I was on the other side of the table. So I know exactly what companies go through from startups to larger companies when you're trying to protect your valuable ideas. Nothing in this presentation or in any material provided, whether verbally in writing, constitutes legal or patent advice. This is what happens when you spend too much time with lawyers. <laughs> so did you know? Patents increase your startup's valuation by $1 million per um, patent filed. This is a rule of thumb used by investors. I actually went looking for the original source of this rule of thumb, made it all the way back to somewhere in the 90s. It seems to have been a rule of thumb from then. Yes? Is it patent filed or patent granted? No, actually filed. Even the filing. Now, why is that? A patent represents potential, just as a startup does. When you file for your patent, just as when you develop your product, your investor is assuming that both will develop to maturity. Your patent will be granted, your startup will be successful. Oh, you have a question? Does original patent count? That is Actually, I have had investors tell me they will count a provisional patent. Of course, it partly depends on how well it's written. You do want to have one that actually looks like a full patent. But the reason why this rule of thumb exists also for provisionals, the same reason. We're talking about potential. Your startup at its valuation is being evaluated on its potential to be a great business. So it is given a higher valuation, which also includes the investor's view of future growth. And so the patent filed, the patent pending, has the same potential. Patents were shown to increase sales by 51%. Now, depending on your business area, this may or may not be because of the actual patent filed. It may be more correlation than causation. However, in some areas, some companies, as your customers, are very sensitive. Large enterprises do not like the idea of working with a company who may be sued later on and they may be forced to stop using your product because you didn't file for a patent. So in that case, it actually does seem to have a direct effect on sales. Patents are also shown to increase employment growth. Again, in some cases, this may be correlation, but in terms of causation, if you have filed for a patent and your competitor has not, investors are more likely to invest in you. One of the saddest uh, postings I ever saw in Quora was the SaaS startup. They were about to get funded by an investor, and then the investor came to them and said, well, your competitor has a patent application to publish, their patent pending, and you didn't file for anything, so I'm not going to invest in you. And he was asking for advice, but basically the problem was that a competitor was in the exact same space with a very similar idea. They filed, you didn't, oh well. So you want to be on the right side of that filing so that investors will come to you and not to your competitors. So we're going to have a quick intro to patents. We're going to talk about why they don't have to be expensive. And of course, we'll talk about your unique value proposition in patents. I don't know if it necessarily go up, goes up by 10x. It partly depends on how much area you manage to capture. So for example, if you manage to block your market niche with patents, then I would say it, it could be that or it could be more, depending on how much you're able to block it. Um, some startups, even with like a large family of filed patent applications, were actually able to increase their valuation significantly because they had the potential to have what is known as a patent thicket, to have so many patents that your competitor doesn't know which way to turn. 
It's like a thicket full of thorns. They literally get caught in it. So the answer is, like so many other things when it comes to legal stuff, it depends. So patents are a competitive advantage. Now, all these folks here have patents. Snapchat, now known as Snap, actually almost lost their patent. They were with a competitor uh, who had also filed for a similar idea. If you know Snap, Snapchat, when you hold down the camera button, it goes to video, if you hold it down long enough. A competitor of theirs had filed with a 19-day filing difference. Now in the US, it is first to file. If you are on the wrong side of those 19 days, you lose. End of story. Doesn't matter how long you're working on your idea. If you work on your idea for three years and I work on a similar idea for three months, but I file first, I win. Google filed for quite a few patents. They filed for patents even before they incorporated, even before they're actually a company. And Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg is also listed as an inventor on a number of their patents. So as I mentioned before, US patents provide a valuation advantage for companies and products. George Mason Law School found that even the value of a software asset would be increased by this amount. So for example, for larger companies, even filing for patents would increase the value of the software asset, not just of the company itself. So talking quickly about patents. Patents are a form of intellectual property. Intellectual property is the property of ideas. It's also called intangible property. Now, you can't put your hand on an idea. And unlike tangible property, intellectual property, ideas increase in value only when you share them. So now you have a problem. You have to share your idea in order to make money. But you also don't want someone to steal your idea or to copy it. So patents protect the core of your idea. They are the best way to protect your idea and still allow you to share it. They're the best defense against copycats. And if you have the right strategy, you can actually block competitors from entering your space. You can actually block a market niche with a set of patents. So what is patentable? This is actually a quote from a Supreme Court case. Anything under the sun made by the hand of man or woman? Software, hardware, high tech, technology is patentable. But so are mechanical devices, chemicals, drugs, and proteins. These are all examples of technology. So what is not patentable? Well, music, images, books, and video, those are all protectable by copyright. So if your idea for your startup is oriented around content, you would protect it more with copyright. If it is oriented around the delivery of the content, that delivery mechanism or system would be protectable with the patent. Names, logos, slogans, Coke, Coca-Cola, Coke the real thing, are all examples of trademarks. These are names under which you trade. And it's a separate type of intellectual property protection. Now, what else is not patentable? Anything you want to keep secret. So what might you want to keep secret? If you have software, for example, running on a client server system, whatever is running on the server may or may not be detectable to the outside world. If you are having software, uh, for example, on a client, and you're giving the client to your user, it can be reverse engineered. So if your users can get your, their hands on your software, then you can't keep it as a trade secret. Chips also, by the way, can be reverse engineered. So if you're thinking to protect it by protect, uh, having a chip, that can also be broken and the secrets can be gotten out. But if you do want to keep it secret, you cannot file for a patent because patents require you to share information about how your invention works with the public in exchange for receiving a 20-year monopoly right. Patentability rules has to be in a patentable category, like software, hardware. It has to be novel, which means new. This is actually quite easy. And it has to have the wow factor. Now, this is subjective. It is compared to what is considered to be one of ordinary skill in your field. There have been tons of court cases over what does it mean? What is enough of a wow? What is a wow? Some examples of ways you can persuade the examiner. You can do it faster with your software or hardware. You can do it cheaper. You can do it better. It solves an unmet need. It's synergistic. You bring these components together, and all of a sudden, something amazing happens. 
But this is something which is very hard to define is that wow factor. It also has to be well described in a patent application. Now, in order to get a patent, you have to prepare and file a patent application in each country where you want to have the right to the patent. If you want to have patent protection in the US, you have to file in the US. If you want to have patent protection in China, you have to file in China. If you file in the US and not in China, someone can copy your idea in China, and they probably will. So you have to think about also your business strategy. Are you going to be international business? Is it important for you to protect your idea all over the world, or will you be US focused? <clears throat> so you can get a patent in four simple steps. Do a search, see if you're first. Google patent search is great, by the way. You base, type, uh, go to Google and type in Google patent. And if you look at their patent search bar, it operates just like regular Google search. You put in a few keywords, and they'll give you back some examples of patents in your area. If you use the advanced Google patent search, you can search by company name. So if IBM is one of your main competitors, you can search for only IBM patents. The search requirements and knowing if you are first, your idea will be compared to patents and patent applications all over the world, but also to anything ever published. So it could be published on a website. It could be published as a scientific article. Google Patent Search will also help you because you can search that as well. And you can also, of course, do a regular Google search. Once you know that you're first, you prepare your drawings and text. You file your application. And the examiner checks your patent. Well, this sounds great, right? So if we do this tomorrow, we'll have a patent. No. Um, the first part goes really well. You do your search. That doesn't take too long. Text and drawings, not long at all, a couple weeks, maybe a month. File the patent application. This is done electronically. So you file, for example, at the US Patent and Trademark Office, and you get a number that same day and a filing receipt. So that's great. And then it stops. There's a big backlog. The examiner will check your patent application, but it can take one to five years or more, depending on how bad the backlog is. This is actually not necessarily bad. This is actually good for startups. Why is that? Because as long as your application is pending and has not been examined, then you can argue that the claims you put in are likely to be granted. And as long as you can make a good case for this, right? I mean, you can't put in ridiculous claims. You can't claim the wheel. Already been done. But once the examiner starts examining your patent application, then everyone will know how much of a patent right or patent monopoly do you have. So it's actually advantageous for startups to let this process go on. Investors will look at published patent applications of your competitors and worry. Even if you think the claims, the part of the patent which gives them the right is too broad, they'll still be concerned. Large companies, if they're looking for another company to work with and they see your competitor has a published patent application with broad claims, hasn't yet been examined, they're also going to worry. Of course, if you're the one with broad claims, then you're, on, you're, actually, you're much happier because then everyone would come to you and say, well, maybe they will get these claims and we should work with them. So this is a good thing for startups. This is an example of a patent drawing. I said it was not hard to do patent drawings and write the description. Well, the patent drawings are quite simple. This is actually from a Facebook patent. It's for the news feed. Mark Zuckerberg is one of the inventors. And it's a bunch of boxes. This is a system. You have some user devices. Could be computers, could be mobile phones. You have the network, which is always shown as a fluffy cloud. This seems to be a requirement in uh, patent applications a social network provider, and a mini feed engine. So this is the basic drawing that you have for uh, software patent applications. You would also have method drawings, which show flows, step one, step two, step three for software, for example. You do not have to have actually built your software to file your patent application, because this is the level of drawing that you need. This is a design. You can't actually build software based on this. But you can understand the design and the flows and the functions. So if you're at this level and you have written these types of drawings, you can actually file for your patent application, even if you never actually built your software or your hardware. 
The only exception to this rule is if you're talking about something like a pharmaceutical, a drug, then it would be good to actually have some data showing it would work. But for software and hardware, a design is enough. So before you get a patent, you filed. You can now say you're patent pending. You should mark your website and your app. Some companies actually use patent applications as a form of psychological warfare. In the Bitcoin area in particular, because everyone is filing and the level of filings are going up by several hundred percent every year, one particular company, whenever they file for a patent application, immediately makes a big announcement on their website and says what they filed for in a very, very broad way. And how do I know this? Because my clients who are in this area always come running to me because their investors are asking them, hey, these guys said they're going to basically patent the wheel in Bitcoin. And I have to say, no, no, they're not going to get the wheel. But they're actually quite clever. They're using it as a way to advertise to investors, potential customers, you should work with me and not these other guys because we have patent protection, or we will. If you file first, you can block others from getting a patent. This is very important. If someone files before you, then they can block you from getting your patent. So you definitely don't want to have that happen to you. Your application is property. One of the reasons why patent applications increase your valuation of your company is they are a form of property. And they're one of the few forms of property that most startups have, which could be sold in the event of the startup not working out. Investors like this because by having this property, they're hedging their bets. They're basically having another guarantee that they'll be able to get their money back. So when to file? If you're in the US only, you can file within one year of publishing your idea. What is publishing your idea? Selling your product, offering your product for sale, describing it in a TED talk, on your website, uh, TechCrunch, or any of the other uh, newsletters. Giving a talk in a public forum like this is a publication. So once you publish your idea, you can only file in the US and only within one year after publication. Outside the US, you have to file before you publish. I know for startups this represents a dilemma, but basically the US system is set up to encourage you to either file fast or publish fast. If you publish your idea quickly, you get one year to file for your patent, but other people do not. Only you have that one year grace period. So if you publish quickly, you can block competitors in that way, but it means you can only file within the US your idea. So you have to decide if you're going to be going international or if you want to stay focused on the US. And of course you can file as soon as you have a design of your idea. Yes? I'm not clear on the difference between a US file and an international. Is it like two separate applications or is it one application? No, it's, it, it could be the same text and drawings but it's actually two separate applications. So for example you'd file in the US and then <laughs> if you wanted to get protection in China you'd have to file in China. Yep. So any other Each, country, so Each country separate. Okay. Europe is considered to be a country. I know it's not, but for the purposes of the patent, it's considered to be one country. Okay. Yes? Going back a little bit, and, uh, you were talking about when you're um, uh, submitting the patents. Uh, is it possible, or how easy is it to make changes to that later on? Let's say you, have a, you, know, you mm -hmm. file a patent for something, and then you find out that you had to made a, make a drastic change to something. Is that something that you can actually go back and have it? edited or, is, or do you have to you know, refile the whole thing? Well, if you file what is known as a provisional, which I'll talk about in a moment, a provisional application is an application that gives you the right to a date for one year. So if you did file the provisional, then during that year you could file a follow-up application or at the end of the year file a regular application with your changes. <laughs> in the US, there is a strange patent beast called the Continuation in Part or CIP. It only exists in the US. And what, it is a secondary application, but you can add material to it. So you have to file another application, but you can get the right to the date of your earlier US application and still add the material. The new material gets a new date. Okay. So, but that's only in the US. Other countries, you're out of luck. But can you extend your claims beyond just application? Well, it depends what you mean by extending them. If there's support in your application, in your text, or your drawings, to change your claims, you can do that. But let's say you have a whole new idea, then you have to file a follow-up application of some type in order to be able to get that whole new idea in there. Okay. 
Okay. Now we're going to talk about why patents don't have to be expensive. So why are patents expensive? Well, <laughs> yes, we'll just blame everything on the lawyers. Now, actually, the reason why patents are expensive is they are done manually. You see these two guys up here hauling girders around. Imagine you're, the only way you could get clothing is if you could, had to go to a tailor and order a bespoke suit, a custom-fitted suit, and there was nothing available off the shelf. Well, clothing would be expensive. It actually used to be very expensive. Folks used to own maybe two sets of clothing if they were lucky, one for every day and then one for you know, Sunday or special use because it was so very expensive because each one had to be done completely by hand. Patents are the same way. There is no way to get a patent off the shelf. Lawyers charge by the hour. Because they charge by the hour, they don't necessarily have to be efficient. Now, we charge fixed price. Lawyers who charge fixed price have to be efficient. So we use, for example, tools to help us do the job. We're not up there with the hammer and the nails. You know, we're using the uh, crane and the lift and all the electrical power tools to make it work faster. Um, intellectual property and legal law in general hasn't really moved into the 21st century. They're working on, you know, the end of the 20th century. Um, but they haven't really gone into a lot of automation or tools to make their work more efficient. So that's why it's so expensive. But it doesn't really have to be. I actually recommend to save money and to get your patent filed faster, starting with a provisional application. It's filed in the US. It only lasts for one year. It's not examined. It has far fewer rules. You can basically put in text and drawings. They do not insist that you file and you follow any particular set of rules for the provisional. Because of this, it's less expensive, but it's also faster. You can get one filed quite quickly. At the end of the year, you have to continue the process. You either have to file a regular US patent application or you have to file internationally. And again, there are tools and mechanisms to help you file internationally without spending a ton of money. Now, what's also nice about, about the provisional is you can file quickly. Let's say you ha want to release your product, you want to publish. You can file the provisional application quickly, publish, and still be able to file in China at the end of the year. So it's a very good way to quickly get your foot in the door. But let's say you're not certain you think you only want to get protection in the US. Then you can actually get the benefit of two one-year periods. Publish now. In one year, you can file your US provisional application, and then you get another year. When you file your US provisional application, any material that you put into it that has not been published before you file can be filed internationally. So you could actually get a whole two-year period and use the first year to test your product, as Swathi said, to try to sell it, to understand what works. At the end of that year, maybe you have some new ideas you didn't publish yet. You put those in the provisional. Those new ideas that weren't published can then be filed at the end of the provisional year in China. So now we're two years out. You've tested your idea. You have protection for everything in the US. You have partial protection outside the US, and you have a validated idea. So the provisional is a great tool. But still, Chinese can steal your idea the moment you publish it, right? They can steal it too. <laughs> the, uh, actually, 95% of all patent lawsuits in China are between two Chinese companies. And the reason why, it is much less fun when someone else steals your stuff. And so they are fighting very, very hard in court in China to protect their ideas with their own patents and to enforce them against other Chinese companies. Now, I have some mechanisms I've used to file and get a Chinese patent to help my clients work with their Chinese partners. For example, one of my clients had a $49 million investment based largely on the fact that they had quite a few patents in China. And because of that, the Chinese company wanted to work with them because why? Who made the investment? Because they wanted to be able to take the product into China when it was fully developed. And they wanted to know that when they brought it in, they could enforce their rights with patents in China. So actually, China's become quite a hotbed of patent filing and also of patent enforcement. So your unique value proposition in patents. Now, Swati talked about Knowing what your unique idea is, your unique value proposition, what is it 
that you're bringing to your clients that's going to benefit them. Not how you're going to take money from them, what's going to benefit them. So patents are a very big part of that, and that's how you can actually protect your unique value proposition. So why do startups succeed? Well, yes, having an excellent idea is great, but also knowing your customer and having a strategy to connect your product and intellectual property. Remember, patents are a form of intellectual property. You want to have a strategy to connect your product and your patents so that you can protect your market niche. When it comes to developing this strategy, first of all, you need to have advanced planning. If you believe that your idea would be good to sell outside the US, you plan to do international business, then you want to file before you publish. You also, of course, need to do research, both market research and also patent research. What's already out there? What have people already done? In many cases, uh, clients who come to me with great ideas, I actually have found that the broadest expression of that idea was already filed for in a patent in the first dot-com boom. The reason why in the first dot-com boom, a lot of companies had great ideas and the technology wasn't there. It just couldn't support the ideas. So there could already be patents out there about your idea. After you do your planning and your research, you need to execute according to the plan and the research. And this is true for both patents, but also for your go-to-market strategy and knowing your customer. So can you do this yourself? Well, you need to know the filing. First of all, startups can be complicated, and you do need to have a strategy. But most importantly, you have to be confident you're making the right choice. Failing to make a choice in the startup world is making a choice. If you decide you're going to put off a decision on your patent, you may be too late. Someone may have filed first and blocked you. You may end up publishing and going past that year. You need to decide what you are doing and understand the reasoning behind it so that you know you're making the right choice for your idea and for your startup in order to be successful. Well, that's it. Both Swathi and I would very much like to thank you. And please, please, please make certain to give us your email address so we can send you the presentation. Any more questions? Uh, yes? Can you tell us about software patents and they do we hold up in court? Yeah, so there, there was a court case that came out a few years ago called the Alice decision, which uh, ended up narrowing software patents. However, in the second half of last year, a number of decisions came out. Okay. In the second half of last year, a number of decisions came out on software patents that actually swung the other way. There are quite a few patents that were held to be enforceable even for things that seem like they would not be enforceable. The reason for this is because it's really hard to know where the bright line is. Is something valid or not valid? So the pendulum went one way, and it seems to be going the other way. Another important point, though, is if you don't file for a patent, you don't have a seat at the table. So if you file for a patent, whether or not it's valid, whatever happens in court, you at least have what is known as a presumption of validity, meaning once your patent issues, it is presumed that it is valid. For that reason, you can have a seat at the table and you can negotiate. Patents are also defensive. So again, if you don't file for a patent and someone accuses you, you of infringement, you have no defense. So I usually recommend to clients to file unless clearly we're going to have a problem due to the uh, Supreme Court decisions. But because it's swinging back and forth so much, it's hard to know exactly where that line is. Sorry, you had a question? OK. <laughs> Swathi's there, yes. Worth, worth the investing of the several tens of thousands of dollars for a non-provisional full patent. Mm -hmm. so how, do we do, how do you know how to do the provisional correctly yourself? 
That is actually a problem because the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, for example, has what they call a guide for doing the provisional, and it's almost impossible to understand. I mean, I actually do this every day, and I have a hard time understanding it. Uh, we actually are developing a set of resources to allow people to understand it and to do more themselves called the Patent Community Center. So again, if I get your email, I'll send you a link and you can join. You just have to give, it's free. You just have to give us your email and then you can come in and see the resources there. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of very good do-it-yourself um, resources. I've also looked at a few books. They weren't very good. Uh, so we are trying to develop some things, but at the moment there aren't as many resources as I would like for people who would like to do their own provisional. Um, in terms of what we offer, if you look on our pricing page, we do offer a do-it-yourself option with a couple of reviews and some help and some guides for $750, a little commercial here, and then $2,500 for our um, basic provisional package. If you do the drawings, we do the rest. So our prices are very competitive. If I do find a good free resource, I will actually let everyone know because I think it's really important that everyone be fully informed. That is one of our big points, is everyone should know all about the process and everything, even to the point of being able to do it yourself. So you're not coming to me because you can't figure out what the heck is going on. You're coming to me because you've reviewed the information. You, you want to make that choice. Unfortunately, there just aren't very many good resources out there to really describe how the process works. Okay, yes? Now, now you remember your question. All right. <laughs> Well, your publish date counts as coming first, okay. but you need to publish a lot of details in order for it to work. If you only publish a vague description, they could file, let's say, more than what you described, and they could block you on that more. So that's why it's important to publish with a lot of details or else file quickly. And of course, once you publish, you still have one year, but then you still have to file your provisional application in order to get that second year. So something has to be filed at the end of one year. Oh, question, yes? Yeah, so let's jump forward. I've got my patent, right? Mm -hmm. I'm very happy, right? In the US, my understanding is that, let's say I get lucky and actually find that somebody is infringing. Because that's not easy to find out. Mm -hmm. If I do discover that somebody's infringing and my patent, not a patient, I know that I know roughly what the cost is to litigate. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't afford it. Since I can't afford to litigate, what other option do I have other than doing nothing? Well, here you'd actually, it's a very good question. If everyone heard it, uh, the question is what do you do if someone's, inf you have a patent, someone's infringing it, you can't afford the full cost of litigation. So you actually have a couple of choices. One choice is you can go to a litigator which will take on the case on a contingency basis, meaning they only get money if they win. Uh, I actually know a very big litigation firm that has asked me to bring them cases because they make most of their money doing this. Um, and they're very, very good and they're very wealthy, so <laughs> they've done quite a good job. Another option is actually to license or sell your patent to a licensing entity, otherwise known as a non-practicing entity or troll in the pejorative, and they will litigate for you. So that's another option as well. Um, and of course, the third option is if you are sold to a larger company, then the larger company can take it on as well. So you have a number of choices. You don't necessarily have to have all the money in your pocket, uh, but usually this is a situation where both the market and your patent will kind of reach maturity at around the same time, that five or six year time frame. Often startups end up developing their market. By the time the market is really worth it to litigate and your um, patent then is much more likely to be granted, at that point, you can start looking for solutions. But of course, in five or six years' time, you may have already exited. It depends on the kind of startup you're looking to build and what your strategy is. Yes? Uh, how do you protect your startup from uh, litigation in like, first five years, for example? I heard about like some companies have like portfolio of patents, mm -hmm. and they like uh, let you subscribe and pay like I don't remember, a couple of hundred bucks per month or something it, like that. Like it, de it depends on the group. So there are groups that have gotten together and they offer to license their patents out. You can also, um, so you can join in these groups. In some cases, in some technical areas, there are specific requirements for how patents are handled. 
There are many, many patents, uh, for example, on cell phones. And they're required to be licensed under a certain scheme if the patents form part of the standard, for example. So many of these cell phone patents are licensed in particular ways, and you can join in that licensing scheme, and you, spend it, you give them a certain amount of money, and you automatically get all the licenses. It really depends on your area. It also depends on whether or not where you are in your process and whether or not another company, for example, might want to try to block you because they're afraid of you and they already have patents. So you also have to look at that as well. So it's a hard question to answer just with one answer. It really depends on where you are, where the field is, and also what options you have available to you. Yes? So you mentioned uh, the research phase being one to five years. That's, that's the examination phase. Right. right. So given that life is short, what if someone dies in that time period after they file, what happens? Um, actually, the examination process goes on. I've actually unfortunately had to do this before. If the inventor dies, then the rights to that uh, patent either rest with the company or alternatively they rest in that inventor's estate. And then they can be transferred like anything else. They form part of the property of the estate. The process continues. Yes. During the research process, can you actually see patents that are, that are, that are pending? Yes, patent applications publish 18 months after the first date from filing. The only exception is if you only want to file in the U.S. You can request to file in the U.S. without it publishing. However, I recommend publication because it's a great way to kind of put your flag in the ground and say, this is my idea and this is where I am. But it's not required if you file only in the U.S. If you file anywhere else, it will have to actually publish. Yes? Another question. Um, what is the status, both in the U.S. and internationally, on patents and method testing? So in the U.S., depending on the amount of technology and also, quite frankly, how it's written, a lot of the patents that were not found to be valid were simply very vaguely written and there was like no technology in there. And the way the claims were written, it sounded like something could almost be done manually. It wasn't clear that a computer was even needed. That's clearly a no-no. If you write something technically on the business method side, it is still potentially possible to get protection in the US. In Europe, it's pretty much forget it. China's in between. It's hard to say exactly how much technology is enough in China, but I have had quite a few things be granted there that seemed a little more on the business method side. Um, but there does need to be like a clear technological component that's required for the invention to work. So the business method patents aren't nearly as broad as they used to be. They used to be extremely broad. Now they have to be focused more on the technology. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but did you say that provisional patents would be making more appealing to like venture capitalists and investors? Yes, because they increase uh, the valuation of your startup. I told you the rough rule of thumb of the million. Of course, they should be well written. Um, I think also another reason why some investors like to see it is they are worried about someone else being able to come and uh, take your idea later on, which is an issue. But also by going through the process, you've actually defined what is innovative, especially if you've done the search, you know what's different, you know what is potentially protectable about your idea, and simply that process can be appealing to many investors. So does by being able to even uh, file for a provisional, does that show <laughs> them that you do have some sort of unique formula or whatever? That that I feel for a number of investors, that seems to be a, a big important factor. They simply want to see that you've done the research. But they also are concerned about you getting blocked. Like in some areas, for example, like blockchain, people are just going to be filing all over the place. VR and AR, tons and tons and tons of patent applications are being filed and more being published all the time. When you're in a situation like that where a lot of people are just going to be filing for anything they can get their hands on, uh, investors in that area may get nervous because they're worried that you'll be simply shut out. That when negotiation time comes and everyone else is at the table with their cards in their hand, you don't have any. So it also kind of depends on your area as well. But is the fact that you've been able to file, is that like indicative that you, you yourself have a unique? I have actually had investors tell me this, yes, because what they want to know is if you've done the research and you've actually been able to file something, you're able to show what is unique about your idea. And that is also quite helpful for investors to know that you've done the work and you can show it. We can demonstrate that what's in there is actually something that's quite unique. It's, so it's not just for what happens later on. It can also simply be the value of the process itself. Yes? So following up on that question, um, if you're an entrepreneur inventor and you develop a 
new technologies that can be used in the business. Um, and you file a provisional patent, which should add value to your business. Mm -hmm. When you put it on your accounting books, how would you do that? How would you actually value it and what would you put on your accounting books in a, in a method that would be uh, good both for your business and for future investors? The problem is that investors, <coughs> from my experience, would just sort of say, oh, that's just, yeah, that's an expense. It's not an asset. I want to be able to put it on my books as an asset. My pa intellectual property is an asset, but it's patented as an asset. How do you value it when you haven't gone public? Well, for that, first of all, I'd actually talk to an accountant, but it is actually one of the big issues. For example, Google, Facebook, those companies, the amount of actual physical capital they have is relatively minuscule compared to their value. Same thing is also true with Apple. Apple does not own those factories where their products are manufactured. They do not own the equipment. They do not have vast amounts of capital equipment. Compare that, for example, to the auto manufacturers, Ford, those guys, they own vast amounts of stuff physical stuff you can put your hands on. So the accounting system, I don't know how much it's actually quite caught up with this, but for that I would actually talk to an accountant. However, valuation of your company is also measured in terms, as I said, of the potential. That's also where the patent application comes in, not just your sales. So you're not going to be looked at like a 2x of revenues or 3x of revenues. They're looking at your potential to grow. And another issue is your potential to be able to block others. So sometimes I'm asked to evaluate the value of the patent applications on a startup's books. One of the things I look at, what can they do in the future to block others from entering that niche? Because even if, as I said, the startup itself does not work as well as they own the, uh, everyone would have liked, the founders would have liked, it is still possible then to license or sell the patents in order to be able to actually get money. And there are some non-practicing entities or trolls that actually started as companies. They were not able to make a success of it as a company. They made a lot of money off of their patents, however. So for your seven, uh, $750 fee mm -hmm. to, for the provisional, mm -hmm. um, do you still charge that if you're not able to technically file, or how does that work? Like, does that, does that We can talk about that after, because I'd need to know, like, basically what your idea is and how you'd want to work. But um, like I said, fixed price means we discuss everything in advance, you know everything in there. I'll also go into more details about what would actually happen right. during that process. Um, but the idea, as I said, is to get something filed as quickly and as painlessly for you as possible <laughs> so you actually have that asset on your books. Okay, we have one more last question that I think. You had said, suggested for a few people to, to search for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Search on their own. What sort of tools, you had mentioned Google, but non-comprehensive, right? You, you don't really know if you're finding the right things or not finding the right things. You're essentially just knocking things out, right? Um, any techniques or suggestions on how people can search that way? Well, actually, one of the ways I recommend, if you're going to do the search yourself, is to look for competitors. Do the Google Advanced Patent Search and put in the name of your competitor under the owner or assignee. And the reason for that is you can see what they're doing in their area. You can also search by class. That's really difficult. Um, there are proprietary tools. I know this gentleman actually sells one. <laughs> so you can uh, go and talk to him. Some proprietary tools can be quite useful, and they're not necessarily expensive. But a lot of it just simply is more of an art and kind of playing around with it a bit to see what's out there sort of a thing. Or of course, you can also come and have a professional do it. But at the beginning, I do recommend that people always try it themselves to get some idea of what things look like so when you talk to someone to do it professionally, you can have a better conversation and a more productive one. <laughs>